Yeah, so if you're a health and wellness brand, a supplement brand, or consumables brand, and you want to use AI to find academic research and literature to back your marketing claims or innovate on your product development to make even better products, um, I think this is a video that would be interesting and valuable. Yeah, and so we talked about and demoed three new AI tools that make it easier than ever before to discover scientific research that help health and wellness brands stay compliant while building their products. All right, earlier this year, uh, one of my friends who spends between 100 and 200 grand a day in the supplements slash consumables market um, shared with me a link that was really interesting. I'm gonna just pop it on screen right now. So it's from the FTC. Uh, the FTC warns almost 700 marketing companies that they could face civil penalties if they can't back up their product claims. And they were pretty hefty. I think they were like something like $50,000 per sort of issue that they found. Um, and so for bootstrap companies, smaller companies that aren't as big as big corporations, like big pharmaceutical companies, like each of these fines could be pretty hefty um, to your bottom line. And so something that came to mind when I saw this was actually sort of the link between this and the new technology that's been coming up when it comes to the AI space around, you know, ChatGPT plugins and others. Um, so in particular with ChatGPT, there's something called Scholar AI that we became hip to that was pretty interesting. Um, and these tools sort of allow you to do I think two things. One of them is if you're already pretty savvy with academic research and accessing it, I think it can help cut down a lot of time for you in accessing it, summarizing it, getting to the points that you, you want to get to as quick as possible to sort of grab that information that you need. Um, if you're not as savvy though, I think it opens up the capability to become a little bit more savvy where you can talk to some of these solutions, these, these software apps, plugins, and have conversations with the research in ways that you couldn't previously. So I'll give an example as in you could potentially find the research a little easier using some of these tools. You can then download the either abstracts or the full texts into PDF, and then you can chat with PDFs as well to sort of distill it for you in a way that was previously a lot more challenging, especially with scientific vocabulary. It's very dense, but at the same time, I'd say to some degree clear and nuanced, um, but it can be like a real mental ram drain to be able to digest everything. And so it's really cool that it's opened up now um, the ability for us to comprehend what scientific literature is saying so that it can be used back in your business uh, for product development, supporting your marketing claims, innovation, whatever it is that you get it for, which is really interesting. And so I know, Alfred, you found uh, three different tools that were sort of interesting to look at. And I'm sure there's many more now as things progress week over week. Um, but the three were Scholar AI, Sight, and Consensus. And I think it'd be interesting to maybe start off with hearing maybe your high level, you know, top three takeaways from using these tools and sort of jumping off from there. Maybe uh, we can start there. What were your three biggest takeaways using these tools and getting sort of a feel for the nuanced application of using them? Yeah. Um, I think first of all, these AI tools in all these different spaces are just so cool. Everything that's coming out, um, super exciting, finding new applications all the time. And yeah, these academic uh, academic AI tools that you mentioned are just another application of how the world is changing with AI. And so, like you said, academic papers can be really dense. I think a lot of times it's difficult for people to read these things and really even understand what the heck they are reading. And so there's a whole profession out there like in knowledge translation where they take scientific research and disseminate it to the, the just the common person so that it just helps uh, people understand what's going on in the academic world and I think 
with AI, that's something that can be done on a on a greater scale in a way that's a lot more personalized. Now you can, as you said, talk with the research instead and ask it the questions you want instead of necessarily having to uh, have someone that takes what they find interesting and telling you about it. Um, so you can start to have those two-way conversations instead of it being one way. Um, but yeah, I think, I think uh, one of the takeaways is just that academic research and the results that are coming out of it is just more accessible than it ever was before. Um, and it's because we can now translate it into just common language that everyone can understand. I think that's the first one. The second one is um, along the same lines of it being more accessible is just that it's easier to find as well. So now we can ask questions like in a similar to a search engine, right? But it's, it's in chat GPT or it's in, in a consensus or in site. We ask the question and we can get an answer that is supported from the research itself. So instead of in the past where we might have had to um, maybe look for a keyword, like let's say we're, we're interested in sleep. And so we're looking for a sleep and then we, gotta, we get a list of papers and this, about sleep and then we gotta read every single abstract and then figure out which ones are even relevant to the subject that we're looking at and then go into them and then read them even further to figure out what is it it's even saying and then do that a hundred times just to kind of get a sense of what the overall um, research says. Now AI can kind of do that for you by just asking a question. And so that really speeds up that initial part where we're just trying to get a high level answer into some sort of question. Um, and I think the third thing is that AI, even though it makes the access to research easier, it doesn't necessarily solve some of the problems that we have when it comes to um, interpreting it. A academic research oftentimes controls the experiment in such a way that it's the, the conditions are like perfect. And so it might answer a question um, and it you know comes to some sort of conclusion, but there's a lot of nuance behind it. And sometimes what we'll see in you know the news headlines is some sort of sensational claim um, that may not necessarily take into account some of that nuance, or maybe it just is misinterpreted or it's cherry picked, right? Like sometimes what we hear from the research isn't actually what the research says. And so I don't know if that necessarily gets um, solved. Yeah, I've got a take on it. I think my, my take on it would be that for those previously who were like just accepting whatever claims people were making or just accepting, hey, I have a study here that backs up what I'm saying. Now you have the ability to actually go and look at that study and say, hey, is what is their interpretation of this actually what they said or actually what they found in the study? Um, it opens up that sort of access. Like if you're mm -hmm. someone who didn't go to school and had lots of interaction with scientific literature, you now have that potential to do it. Like if someone says, hey, this supplement will help me with, you know, blackheads a whole bunch and they're citing this specific study, um, you can go and validate whether that's really true or did they just like take this one thing and extrapolate this thing way too far. Um, so I think for consumers, there's that, like it opens up the ability for consumers to sort of do their own due diligence and not necessarily get the wool pulled over their heads. Um, but on the other side of it, it does allow for, I think businesses and entrepreneurs who are maybe very opt opportunistic to have more access to being able to say things and extrapolate things in ways that they probably shouldn't be doing. And so it's like the, the, the problem is probably not so much the tool, but the problem is like, who's using the tool. I like that. Um, the other thing is there, these tools pull a certain, certain papers that I'm not sure how relevant they are, 
right? Are these the papers that are most reputable from the most reputable journals or the from the researchers or labs that are the experts in this field? And are there, is there more weight given to one versus the other or are they just weighted equally, right? Does it take into account whether this study design was conducted properly or not? Um, and or whether this study has stood the test of time, right? And so it's more like what, not every research paper is created equal. And I don't know if AI is able to, uh, the AI tools that we're looking at, whether it's able to take that into account and, um, and present the information by saying, hey, you know, maybe there's these two, two different studies. One is saying A, the other one's saying B, but A is the one that uh, the scientific community is, has consensus around. I think oftentimes that tends to come from whether it's been repeated multiple times by labs around the world or whether it's been cited numerous times. Right? I think that is typically how we would look at that if we were to do our own research. And so I don't think AI could I think AI could definitely follow that as well. I just don't know how these tools specifically have handled that situation. As far as the tools themselves, how would you go about using them as far as in a workflow? Are they sort of you pick one of the three and um, it's like winner takes all between the three of them? Or do they each sort of fit into different parts of the workflow depending on what you're going after? Yeah, I think it's more the second one. The I I like consensus and sight um, when it comes to just asking a probing question. So let's say we're starting completely from scratch, and we you know we are maybe looking up some uh, supplement that we don't have much knowledge on and we want to learn more about it. And we don't want to go to Google because um, maybe we're not getting scientific results from it. So we might go into site, we might go into consensus and ask the question, um, does this supplement, like the supplement A help with B? And you can start to get an answer and what supporting papers there are to uh, that that talk about it, and then once we have identified some of those papers, then that's where uh, Site or Scholar AI come in and are a little bit more helpful because you can then start asking questions about that paper in those tools to get a better understanding of how did they conduct that study or what was the conclusion or or what other studies have have shown similar results. And so you're able to dig deeper with those ones. Um, consensus, uh, for me, I thought was the best tool when it comes to just sort of answering simple questions, like yes, no questions, or, or you know, if, if uh, you know, sleep is, is improved if you take melatonin. Like, you know, a question like that, I feel like consensus was actually quite good because it looks through a bunch of different papers it finds papers that say yes, uh, answers it yes, finds some papers that say no, some papers that say maybe, and then uh, and then kind of gives you the results. It's it's almost like it does a literature review for you on the spot. That's cool. So it doesn't sound, it's sort of like if you're starting out and you're starting pretty broad, consensus might be a good place to start. And then once you know a little bit more where you want to probe then you start getting into site and scholar yeah yeah so i'd say consensus is broad site is sort of in between you can ask it broad questions and it will give you an answer um and tends to give answers that are a little bit more specific to the question that you are asking about um and also lists different um studies that are relevant to it. Um, and it does it in a conversational manner. Consensus doesn't really have uh, a conversational 
ChatGPT style interface. It's more of a yes, no type of answer. Um, and then, uh, and then both scholar AI and site, you can ask those probing questions as well. One of the things that you're able to do when you can see and talk with, uh, whether it's, um, I'm just getting the names again. <laughs> uh, yeah. So let's say you're using, um, site or scholar and they give you some specific papers to look into and helping you digest that information. I think one of the cool applications from that is you can come up with interesting marketing angles that you wouldn't previously. The way that they described a mechanism of action or the way they described um, the comparison between the treatment and the control group, just the way that they said something might spark an idea for an angle that you might want to use. Um, so I think that's really interesting is like, it's, it's, it's another place where you can get information to use, to come up with angles, ideas, and hooks, um, without having to necessarily be creative when it comes to like creative in the sense of having to think a bit on your own, but rather creative in the sense you can be creative instead in the sense of, Hey, I'm seeing the way they're describing something and I can make a link towards that and how I can demonstrate or how I can communicate the effectiveness of my product or the, um, the reason why you should pay attention to my product. I'm thinking about it like, okay, if I'm more academically minded, how do I make sure that I'm getting to the truth? And that's sort of the way I was approaching it. But I think what you're talking about for sure is sort of like that next step. Cool. Anything else you want to mention about these tools? All three have a user friendliness to them, right? So for a beginner, you can use all three, uh, even if you don't have any academic, academic scientific type background. Site has a lot of additional features that have been designed for researchers where they look at the way citations are made and use AI to determine whether that citation supports or contradicts th those studies. So you can actually at a glance see like, hey, this study is one that's well supported by others or not. Um, and so they have little tools like that that make it, um, I think that help researchers in particular. I think what might happen is someone who goes into site might get a little bit overwhelmed if they see some of those things and not sure, or they may not understand what it is that they're looking at. But if they just go to the assistant and just chat with it, like ChatGPT, then I think they'll get what they need. I think it's demo time. All right, let's take a look at it. First, we can take a look at Scholar AI, which is a plugin with ChatGPT. If you have ChatGPT+, you can go into the plugins area and then take a look at the plugins and select Scholar AI. So that's what we've done here. We've selected Scholar AI, and now you can just ask it a question. So recently I've been trying to improve my sleep, so melatonin is a popular su supplement for that. Why don't we ask it about that? So does the scientific consensus support melatonin supplements improving sleep quality? Okay. So let's see what it says. So now that we have the results, we can take a look. You can, you can see that it used Scholar AI as the plugin, and it came up with three different studies. We're able to read some summaries here. And if we also want to, we can go into the full text and look at it a little bit more closely. In this case, it looks like you get a PDF file. And so if we wanted to, we can dive deeper into that study. And I think if we click over here, we'll be taken to the actual journal that it's from and uh, the abstract. And so that gives us the ability to look at this, see if this is interesting enough from a summary level and then dive deeper if we want to. And so we could even ask it more questions. 
So let's say, let's say we want to take a look at this one. We might ask it, what is the sample size in this study? And let's see what comes back. So apparently there's no sample size in that. Um, we could go into the actual study and take a look at that. I'm not going to go and verify that right now. Uh, but you do have the ability to ask it some questions. So maybe let's ask it a question where I do know there's an answer to. So so it seems that they're using some food supplements here. So why don't we ask it about that? So which food supplements are used in the study? That looks about right, because we can see here that there is one aquali, oniria, and circadin, and that looks like the three there. So, so it allows you to ask questions about the paper and get some immediate answers, which just helps us absorbing these studies compared to having to go and read these academic papers, which sometimes can be difficult to read and understand. Next, we have a tool called Cite. This one is more geared towards academic use and uh, they provide an alternative way to look up papers and citations compared to more traditional academic academic tools like Scopus or Web of Science. So this would be a tool that has some additional cost associated with it. Um, so they have a monthly plan, and a yearly plan, whereas with Scholar AI, it'd be free to use as long as you had ChatGPT+. But the way you'd use it is pretty similar. You can go to the assistant and you can start asking it questions. So why don't we ask the same question as we did previously? We said, does the scientific consensus support melatonin supplements improving sleep quality? And so in this case, it actually has more of a aggregated result. So with Scholar AI, it just listed three studies and gave a little bit of a synopsis of what those three studies are. Here, it actually talks about it and, and references multiple studies at the same time. So for example, uh, you know, it says here, the scientific consensus supports the claim uh, that melatonin supplements can improve sleep quality. And it just gives further detail about it. So in this case, the site assistant here is providing a more direct response to the question supported by different studies. So we can hover over one of these studies and it gives you a little bit of information here, a quick synopsis, the authors. And so what we can do is we can go in and click into this into the study and it'll give us the list of papers that it's been cited by and a little bit more information on the study here, the abstract, and you can go and view the full text. So you can find the full text and dig deeper into the study if you want to. We can take a visual representation of how these citations are. And so you can see that this is the original paper and here are some of the different papers that are referencing it. And so you'll see here, there's a green line and a blue line. This corresponds to these little icons with numbers beside them. So this is where Cite uses their own AI to represent citations in a way that's different than the normal academic research tools. If you're familiar with Scopus or Web of Science, those ones typically will list the number of citations that a paper has, but it doesn't have any context on the nature of those citations. What they've done is they've said, okay, there's 232 publications that cite this work. One of those citations support this work. One of those citations are contrast this work and 151 just sort of mention the work. And so what makes this really interesting is if you can see a higher number beside the green check mark and a lower number beside the question mark, then you know that there's more studies that are supporting this work, which makes it more of a credible source. If it's the opposite and you see more of these question marks, then you may conclude that this is actually a work that's not well supported in the academic research. So this is one of the values that Cite brings is the ability to get some context on how these citations on these papers perceive the work that you're looking at. And on top of that, just having a really great chat tool, which can talk a little bit more about the research as a whole, instead of looking at singular studies. So previously we asked which food supplements were used in the study. 
So maybe we can ask a similar question. Now, Site didn't mention this study specifically in their result, so we'll see if it actually picks it up or is able to find this study. Looks like it found it, and it lists the supplements there, and it also lists a few other uh, studies that were done that seem to be similar. And so generally speaking, it just seems that site provides a more contextual and nuanced answer, and it seems like a really great tool to do your literature reviews or to just do some initial research to figure out in the big picture what is the answer to your question before you dive deeper into the supporting evidence. And finally, we have a tool called Consensus. This is also a really great tool to do initial research and literature review. Like Site, it is a paid tool, but you do have a free option, so you can always test it out. And if you like what you see, then you can upgrade for $8 a month. So why don't we start by asking it the same question as we did previously? Does the scientific consensus support melatonin supplements improving sleep quality? What you get initially is a number of studies and it provides a simple yes, no, or possibly answer to your question. And if you turn on the synthesize option, then it'll actually provide a summary telling you what it concludes from your question and a meter here where you can get a better sense of whether or not there is scientific consensus on this question that you may have asked. And so in this case, it seems like that there is pretty strong evidence to show that melatonin supplements improve sleep quality, um, but it's not universal. There is still 30, 37% that is possibly or no, but 62%, that's quite strong. And so this gives you a starting point for your research. What I like about consensus is its simplicity. Keep in mind that the results are not 100% accurate, but it can give you great direction on the questions that you're trying to ask and how it's being supported in the academic community. And sometimes that's all we really need to get started. And if we need to dig deeper, then we can do that by going into any one of these studies. So we can look deeper into this, we can read the abstract, we can go view the full text and read the whole article. So there's a lot we can do with that. And it just helps us find these studies just a little bit easier and gives us some context on how it answers the question at hand. Now, what consensus probably doesn't do is answer questions specific to the study. Why don't we ask it that same question as before about the supplements in that other study? So again, I'm not sure if it's going to be able to find this study because it wasn't necessarily part of the search results in here. Yeah, so it wasn't able to find results here, but we can ask it about a study that it does see. So why don't we take this one here and see if it can answer questions like this. And no, it can't. Ultimately, the types of questions you're supposed to ask consensus is ones where it can determine whether there's some academic consensus on that topic. Here are some examples, and the question that we had asked, does melatonin help with sleep quality, falls in that category. Now, if you want to dig deeper into the article and ask questions about how the study was conducted or what kind of results it got, then that's more for Scholar AI Insight. So there are different use cases, but they can all be really useful when used together. And so it has a very simple to use interface. You can ask any types of questions and it looks at a number of different studies all at once to give you an aggregate answer that is based on academic research. Thanks for watching to the end of this video. Please like and subscribe to help us out. If you want help with implementing AI tools into your business, leave a comment with the prompted below and we'll reach out.